going to say good afternoon. Um, but, uh, you know, today has been incredible. And guys, I think even Friday night was incredible. Uh, if you weren't there, you should have been there. Because we had a night of atonement. And what it was, it was a night where we could just get in front of each other and just be totally open of where we're at with our faith, what sins that we've been in, what temptations that we've had, so that we can be so uh, complete unity. And we can be there to support each other. I mean, uh, that, that's one of the things I, I love about uh, being uh, being a husband. Is that I have a wife that I can, I can just share everything I'm feeling with her. Um, you know, when you have a best friend, you can share your hurts. You can share your, your triumphs. You can share your victories. You can share your defeats. You can share the good news. You can share the bad news. You can share uh, any troubles that you have. Uh, and I love, uh, you know, especially in the Bible, love is commanded, but even, even look around this room right now. You see people of every different color and language and nation. You see, love is commanded, but friendship is a bit more magical. In this room today, it's, it's very magical to see how different people can come together and worship one God. Amen. You know, there's a statistic out there, and it says that single men are jailed more often. They may earn less, but they have more illnesses and die at a younger age than married men. Married men with cancer live 20% longer than single men with the same cancer. Women who often have more close friendships uh, than men survive longer with the same uh, cancers. Married men are not. Married or not, relationships do keep us alive, do they not? Yeah. I mean, well, we are relational beings, are we not? Yeah. Yep. And so the title of our lesson is going to be based about the greatest relationship that we can ever have. The greatest connection that we can ever have. The title is A Cosmic Connection. Come on. We're going to study out Luke chapter 18 today. And so we have a work cut out for us, so let's go there to Luke chapter 18. A cosmic connection. You see, it's amazing to be connected with uh, each other in love and friendship, uh, but it's a whole different playing field when it comes to being connected with God. In Luke 18, we're going to start here in, uh, in verse 1. We're going to read right here uh, two parables. That's going to be our, our first point. And then the, the latter portion of the chapter is going to be our second point. And verse 1, it says, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Oh, baby. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Yeah. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Our first point is a cosmic connection through supplication. Wow. Supplication is the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. Yeah. I want to, I want to uh, rename this parable and call it the parable of persistent prayers. Okay. You see, Jesus is giving a message to, to the guys that are following him. Yeah. He says, hey, have unre unrelenting prayers because you have an empathetic God. Mm. He, he uses a, a parable, and a parable is a, it's a story with, with a spiritual deeper meaning to it. And he, he uses this, this widow as an example. Now, widows back then, they were uh, harassed and taken advantage of because they were seen helpless and, uh, and, and weak. And so what people do is they take advantage of them monetarily. Uh, maybe you may take advantage of them uh, uh, physically. And he's saying, you know, here's this, this widow goes to this judge asking for help against someone who's harassing her. And this, this judge, he's unjust, he's uncaring, he's selfish, and there's absolutely no relation right there. 
And he's, he's using it as an example because he wants them to see that God is the, the total opposite. That God, he is just. God, he is caring. God, he is compassionate. God, he is selfless. And you can totally have a relationship with him. Come on. You see, when you ask help from, from, from somebody, uh, more likely than not, you're going to get help from a friend rather than from a stranger. Yeah. You see, as, as a disciple, your best friend in the whole universe is God himself. Yep. Out of the millions and billions and trillions of life forces, God cares about you. You are just a, a speck in this universe. And God cares about you. The theme we see here is determination and desperation. I think it's interesting in verse 6 through 7, 6 through 8, it says that, uh, that won't God bring on about justice for his chosen ones who cry to him night and day? Will he keep putting them off? And it ends with, it ends with will Christ find faith on earth? I think it's interesting. Is he's basically saying the size of your faith is the same as how much you pray. They're the same thing. Well, let's go to the next parable. And uh, we're, we're going to read right here 9 through uh, 14. He says, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down at everyone else. So these people were self-righteous. They are self-satisfying. They are arrogant. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee who was a, a religious leader, and the other a tax collector. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone looked down upon the tax collectors back in this time. Yeah. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Basically saying, I do more than what the Bible tells me to do. But, tax, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast. And said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. Wow. Come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. Come on, bro. Here, Jesus is talking to people that are self-righteous. Yeah. Right? Amen. Religious, just because it was a duty. Going to church, just because that, that's a good thing to do. Hmm. And yet, I, I, I love how Jesus gives a vision to even a wicked person of how to change. Come on. Again, we see the, the theme here is determination and desperation, especially from this tax slide. Yeah. And, and the whole point he's trying to get across is to have vulnerable prayers because you have a forgiving God. Mm -hmm. To have vulnerable prayers because you have, have a forgiving God. Well, you know, he's showing them of, of how to pray. The kind of heart to have and to not be persistent. You know, I want to, I want to rename this parable. The parable of penitent prayers. Hmm. The parable of penitent prayers. It's amazing. Uh, two two uh, months ago, uh, there was a Good News email sent out. And what, what that is, is uh, uh, we're not just a local church. We're actually our international church. So not just because of the, the colors of our skin here uh, in the room, but literally uh, over 90 congregations around the whole world are having the same service. It's it's amazing. Cool, bro. And... Uh, well, one of uh, one of the sisters actually uh, co-leads with her husband at the, the Dallas church, Shay Sears, wrote an article in the Good News email of what God did to her life. And I just want to share that with you guys today. Come on, bro. And she quotes in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. I am so grateful to be part of a worldwide move, movement because as we grow, not only are more souls being saved, but the hope for our families grows well. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up, my mother and I had a saying that, was, that we would express daily before she dropped me off at school. I would say, I love you, and she would say, how much? 
Then I finished out with All the Way to Heaven. Uh, 11, years, uh, 11 years ago, while I was at college at Cal State Fullerton in Orange County, I was reached out to and asked to study the Bible. After three weeks of study, Tracy Harding baptized me into Christ. Although I rejoiced in the treasure of having a relationship with God, my heart was tinged with a hint of sadness. When I looked at my mom and knew that I could not at that moment say, all the way to heaven. That day, a fervent, impossible prayer began for my mom's soul. Amen. She was less than fired up with my decision to become a disciple as she printed out and read every persecution article she could get her hands on. And even had some spicy talks with the Hardings and the Keens. Oh, Over the years, I watched my mom go through some very challenging trials in her life that brought her to her knees and opened her heart to see her need for God. Yeah. I am beyond grateful for the many women like Linda Moreno, Sharon Kirchner, Connie Ungerhill, Lloyda Friendsley, Elena, and Elena McKean, and so many more who have watered the seed that was planted in her heart. Wow. A special thank you to Judy Harding, Teresa Antelon, and Tracy Harding who studied the Bible with her. Truly, it was God who made her love and faith grow. And just last week, my sister Lori and I were able to fly from Dallas to Los Angeles and surprise my mom by, emer by emerging from the Harding's room during the sharing. Shortly after the sharing, Lori and I baptized my mom into Christ. I always admired my mom's strength, but today what makes her beautiful is her, is her vulnerability and willingness to show her weaknesses so that God can be her strength. Wow. Now as sisters in Christ, I can say with confidence, Mom, I love you! How much? All the way to heaven. <laughs> It says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Yeah. You know, th there's a saying out there. It says, to, to pray as if it depends on God, but to work as if it depends on you. Yeah. That's right. I remember uh, just a few years ago, uh, I was, I was in, in the Boston church, and uh, there, there, there was uh, two twin sisters that moved from D.C. to Boston to go to uh, school up there. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about Sherry and Sharon Green. Yeah. And, and so they moved up there, and it, it, was, it was, I was actually just sharing with Travis earlier, um, a one bedroom, one bathroom for uh, about 700 square feet uh, will cost you about $1,800. Oh, and so it, it's a little bit, bit pricey in Boston. Yeah. And so you can imagine the, the budget and uh, what that was like. But uh, once, once Sunday came, towards the end, of the end of the month, when all the bills got piled on, and you had to make a choice, either pay for the rent, and stay in their place and not give contribution or to give contribution to God to fulfill their vow and not pay rent. You know what they chose? To live by faith and to give to God. And it was a miracle how just when they got home they checked the mail and they got a, a letter in the mail from the school saying, hey, you overpaid your tuition. Here's some extra money that we're going to be merciful. And they're wow. able to pay the rent. Wow. You know, a, a disciple who prays persistently, fervently, and passionately has faith that is seen by action. Yeah. And those same actions they have are just as radical as their prayers. Yeah. You see, what situation are you faithless about? Is it being fruitful, making a disciple, getting a, uh, hopping into a Bible study? Well, I want to challenge you to pray, make a decision to live by faith and not by sight. Put your trust in God and not man. Is it a faith that's about the transition of leadership that we just had? I want to challenge you to pray, make a decision to live by faith and not by sight. And to give your heart and make your every effort to serve those who lead you. Come on. Come on. Faith is this about your future after college. Come on. About where you can get a job, uh, where you can get an internship. I want to challenge you to pray and make a decision not to be anxious, but with prayer, petition, pray to your God who cares for you. Yeah. 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 Are you this about being passionate, being someone that's different? Pray and make a decision to live by faith, not by sight, not by your feelings, but by what God means. Are you this about your financial hardship? Pray and make a decision to live by faith, not by sight, because Malachi 3.10 says uh, to give faithfully, sacrificially, and consistently, and he will take care of you. 
he is not like the unjust judge. Right. Yeah, come on. Are you faith is about going to the Global Leadership Conference next month over in LA? Pray and make a decision to live by faith, not by sight. Make a plan and be ambitious about it. Amen. The Bible says, my righteous ones will live by faith. My question for you this morning is, will you be his righteous ones and live by faith? Let's go to verse 15 in Luke 18. You see, a cosmic connection is, yes, through supplication, but it's also through submission. And verse 15 says, People were also bringing babies to Jesus from for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. No babies. You know, you think about a little child. You guys tell, tell a little child anything they'll believe. Yeah. You tell a little child, hey, there's this old fat man that goes around the whole world one night a year in a red sleigh, has these deer called reindeer, and they fly, uh, and he, he sees billions of children in one night. And if you leave, uh, if you leave cookies and a glass of milk out there, that he'll eat them up. <laughs> you tell a child that, they're going to believe you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you trying to get across? A child simply trusts. A child simply trusts. But so much more than that, simple trust is a salvational issue. Trusting God is a salvational issue. You see, do you have this kind of childlike belief in the Bible? That when the Bible says it, that you believe it. The, not, the next message that I was trying to get across was the mission of the church, even the mission, the mission of Jesus, was to help those who are both powerful and those who are dependent, who are inferior. So yes, those who are powerful here at, at UF, or in, if, if you have a full-time job, uh, but also, that's why we have a kid's kingdom right next door. Why? Because we want to serve the children. Amen? Amen. The next generation. Um, well, the next scripture we're going to read right here is a man that approaches Jesus. We'll look here in verse 18. It says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that's a question that you could ask Jesus right there. <laughs> hey, how do I get to heaven? Let's see what Jesus says. He says, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. He's trying to make him, he's, trying, he's making sure he knew who he was talking, who he was talking to. Yeah. You know the commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him, and look what it says in Mark version. It says, He looked at him and loved him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Amen. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age in the age to come eternal life. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Jesus has a little confrontation here with this rich young, young ruler. Yeah. A very self-righteous man, just like we read about in the parables. Yeah. And what was this righteous man all about? Well, he was religious. He was just fulfilling his duty, checking a box, going to church, you know, making sure he was doing this and that. And yet, for him, it was all about the bare minimum. It was all about living a, a comfortable Christianity, a comfortable religion. And it, it was sad. And Jesus challenged him and said, hey, if you really want eternal life, you got to do this. And he went away sad. 
And he's trying to help him see, he's like, your treasure, the one thing you lack is treasure in heaven. That's the one thing that you lack. You see, he was sad because he wasn't willing to give it up. You know, is there anything that you're unwilling to give up for the cross of Christ? Is there anything you're willing to give, unwilling to give up for the glorified Jesus? You see, because Jesus isn't dead. You go to Buddha's uh, tomb, you find his bones. You go to Muhammad's tomb, you find his bones. You go to Confucius' tomb, you find his bones. You go to Jesus' tomb, and he is not there. He is living up in heaven with his father. Amen. You see, it's impossible to get to heaven, to have that cosmic bond, to have a relationship without following Jesus the way that Jesus says it. Are you a disciple the way Jesus says what a disciple is? Do, do you know what a disciple is? If you don't, you're not a Christian. Because the Bible is very clear. Come on, bro. I, I love what the disciples said to him. He says, hey, Jesus, we, we've given up everything. Why have they done that? Because the relationship with God was far more valuable than anything else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Come on. What, what, what can be so valuable to us nowadays? Grades? Financial security? Relationships? Emotions? What's temporary? Pain? Career? Money's temporary? You see, the message he's trying to get across is to rely on God's power to get to heaven and not your own. Let's read here verse 31. Jesus took the told aside and he told them, Hey, we're, we're going up to Jerusalem. And everyone that is written, everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Jesus was revealed how he... Jesus was revealed to God, by God, how he would die. God made it very clear. They're going to spit on you. They're going to mock you. They're going to insult you. They're going to disrespect you. But you are sent to preach to them. You are, you are sent to give them life. And I love what Jesus, you know, this is, this is the third time he predicts his death. I mean, third time he's telling these guys, hey, I'm going to die. But I love Jesus. Why? He's totally surrendered. You see, we see the rich young ruler, he was reliant on his self to get to heaven and not on God's power, God's saving power. And Jesus, he has surrendered to God's plan. He has surrendered to God's plan. You know, is there anything in your life that, that you're not surrendered to? Any hardship that, he, that he's brought you through? Because it was through hardship that we've had the forgiveness of all our sins. It was through hardship that we don't only get temporary comfort, we get eternal comfort in heaven. Yeah. Well, let's keep on going. There's a, the, the last man that we're going to read has, a, has an interaction with Jesus, and he's a blind man. So, it says in verse 35, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It sounds all like the tax collector with the parable. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. You see, when you want something, you're willing to go after it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get to heaven, you want to have your sins forgiven, you want to get baptized, you plead and beg, what do I have to do to earn eternal life? Yeah. What do I have to do to get to heaven? Yeah. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Wow. I think it's kind of interesting, he's blind, so you think yeah. it'd be, it kind of makes sense, but it's always good to ask, yeah. what's what he wants, amen? Yeah. <laughs> Lord, I want to see, he replied. Come on. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Wow. 
Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Amen. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Amen? Amen. Wow. Yeah, wow. This guy was born blind for God to do a miracle through him yeah, all these years later. Super power. Mm. Super power. I like that. <laughs> you see, this man, I mean, a lot of us know uh, Austin Devine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Austin Devine is blind. Uh, he, he's in his, in his 20s. He just moved down to Miami to be part of the mission team. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can imagine Austin, uh, someone that, that, that's blind and has a stick, like, if they're not guided around the city, there's no way they can understand where they're going to go. Yeah. yeah. If they're not shown the different paths and the different sidewalks and places that are safe and not, they can go right into a bush, they can go right into a, a house, they can go right into a brick wall, they can go into a river. They might have a little confrontation, confrontation with an alligator right there. Yeah. <laughs> See, Austin is dependent on people yeah. to help him get where he needs to go. Yeah. This blind man was totally dependent on people's mercy to give him money to survive yeah. and to show him where to go to get his uh, to, to get something to drink or something to eat. His whole life depended on it. And we see that God allows hardships so that we be, so that we will be able to see our need for him. Come on. You see, the one who is truly rich by faith follows God by faith. We need to see who Jesus is just as the blind man did. Because sight is not a matter of the eyes. Sight is a matter of the heart. We see this story and the message is to be dependent on God's amazing mercy. You see, a cosmic connection can only come by true submission. I remember about seven years ago, I was starting to apply to, to, to some colleges. Um, and I, I grew up in Cape Cod, which is uh, about two and a half hours southeast of Boston. In Cape Cod, it's, it's almost an island. They, they cut a, a canal through it, so it's a peninsula, basically. The only, only way you can get from Cape Cod to the mainland is by going across a bridge. And uh, in, the, in the winter, there's about 100,000 people. And in the summer, it grows about by 100% and becomes a million people. Wow. And so it's, it's vacation land in the summer. Wow. And uh, I, I have some big issues with road rage growing up. Um, I, I, just, I just hated all the traffic. I hated people that they, they didn't know where to go. And I think, it's, I think it's very humbling how I can move from city to city and I don't know where to go anymore. <laughs> People honk at me now, they go, oh, yeah, and I see it now. Um, but but I, I just wanted to get out of the Cape. I wanted to get out of Massachusetts. I wanted to break free, explore different lands, meet different people, experience different uh, adventures. And so what did I do? I applied to five colleges. Uh, three were out of state. Uh, it was uh, Lehigh University, was number one in Pennsylvania. And then Vanderbilt, uh, down in Tennessee. And then RPI, which is in upstate New York. And then my two backups were two state schools. And so by February of my senior year, I hear back from the two state schools that I got in. Awesome. What about the top three? Uh, March goes by, nothing yet. April goes by, nothing yet. May comes up, and I finally get some letters in the mail. I, I open them up, look at them, and got rejected oh. from all three. Oh, wow. And by that time, I was two weeks past due for my uh, deposit for the other two colleges. Oh. In about four months' time, I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. And so, so we, 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 we fought with the school, we, we talked to the friends and the family, we had connections, we, we talked to the football coach because I was going to play football for them for a number of years, and, and I, I heard back about maybe a month before school started, right in July, that I got back put on the admission list. Oh. And uh, I tell you guys, that, that, was, that, was, that was so relieving. So relieving. And, but what's amazing, that first year of school was my hardest, uh, hardest year ever. I mean, fighting with roommates, um, um, fi fighting over girls, Fighting over leadership positions. Uh, I was so selfish and ambitious that I just I broke, I, uh, uh, drove myself into the ground. And it led me to a point where I was on my knees. And I started praying and reading every day. And then that second year, uh, one of my friends asked me if I wanted to start, to start studying the Bible. I was like, yeah, sure, I'm trying to get into it. 
And it was amazing how God allowed me to be rejected from where I wanted to go. Yeah. And put me in my last choice of school, which, which was only half an hour from my house. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't get far at all. <laughs> and, 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 and though I didn't get my dream, I was able to capture the dream that Jesus had for me and become a Baptist disciple. Come on. Come on. And as I was studying the Bible, I was actually uh, d dating a girl. And, uh, you know, I, I understood uh, the, the convictions that, that I needed to have as a disciple. And so, so uh, we, we broke up. And then about two weeks later, after I became a Christian, I fly out to the Indian Ocean to do an internship on a uh, U.S. naval ship for about two months. So I'm out there, and all the while I find out, uh, middle of July, that, that she actually gets baptized and becomes a disciple. Wow. wow. And so I, I'm fired up, I'm like, yes! Yes! Awesome! We get, we, we, I then go back to the States, uh, talk to different brothers, and they say, hey, you know, you really should wait to, to start dating her. Wait until you guys get a little more solid with the Lord, and then you can be able to, to lead her, because you want to learn how to lead yourself first before you lead another person. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I totally disregarded anything they said. Um, we, 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 started, we started dating. And I can tell you, that was some of the hardest months of my discipleship. Why? Because I did not know how to lead. You see, I was so prideful that I, I didn't listen to the people around me give me godly advice. And four months later, we, we sit down with, with, with another couple in the church. And we, we, we talk and we, we mutually decide to break up to make sure that we get strengthened by God first. Um, and then, you know, hey, when we get our, uh, you know, true, true life from, from God first, hey, then we come back together and start dating again. And um, so we did that. But one month later, she falls away. And I had to take a step back because I, I was rocked for about four months. I mean, I was, I was on the fringes. But I started to see how my selfish decisions damaged this woman's chances to be with God for eternity. So yeah, I, was, I wasn't su submitted to the advice and the Bible of God who was trying to guide me in my decisions in my life. Yeah. I wasn't surrendered to the advisors in my life or even what the Bible says about getting advice. Yeah. You know, when we don't listen to the Bible, we don't trust the Bible. We don't really trust God. But you think about God, the, the just judge. The one who's knitted you in your mother's womb. Who knows the very hairs on your head. Who knows the names of all the stars. I mean, we put like different X's and 1's and we, we try to come up with different names, but there's just so many. Who takes care of all the birds? Who takes care of the millions, billions, trillions of life forces throughout the universe? And God knows what's best for us. You see, disciples are surrendered and allow God to be Lord, to be master over their time, their dime, and their mind. Yeah. With their time, with their, with their schedule, their priorities. With their dime, with, with giving sacrificially. And with their mind, with focusing on what they think about every day, every moment of the day. You see, what you think about the most is what you become the most. When we get anxious, annoyed, or defensive, or even sad like the rich young ruler, we have taken the reins back into our own hands. We become self-dependent. You know, I was uh, with a UF student uh, this week, and we are doing a Bible study. And uh, he said something to me that was, that was pretty profound. And he's like, you know, I have faith in schooling. I, I, I have faith in what the textbooks say about chemistry, uh, about the topics I'm studying. I have faith that when, when they say that this chemical bond has exactly 120 degrees all different sides, and that the structure is perfectly exactly how they depict it with these chemical compounds, and I'm not a chemist, I'm an engineer, so. Uh, Come on. But he's like, you know, I never measured it myself. I never seen it for myself. I only depend on what they say. But I have faith in what they in what they say in the textbook is what is right. And he said, and, and, yet, and yet there should be no difference when it comes to the word of God. Right. When it comes to the Bible. You see, I, I wanna come on, Peter. 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 
I want to remind us the day that we, come, that we became Messiah. The day that we got baptized. I mean, didn't you just feel great? Yeah, didn't you just feel so relieved and you, just, you felt so free? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even uh, Friday night, the night of atonement, where we just confessed our sin to each other, and you just feel like there's a, a weight lifted off. Yeah. Yeah. That you don't have to hide it anymore. That you never have to hide it because we, we trust each other, we trust God, and we share, uh, we have everything in common. Amen? Right. But you, you just feel so awesome because you surrendered everything That's right. to God. That for once in your life, you finally trust the people on a heart level. You know, and it gives a challenge to, to read the Bible every day. Yeah. To study the person that, who brought you out and be radical and obey the Bible. Yeah. I love in John uh, chapter 7, check there real quick. John 7 verse 16, he says, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out either my teaching comes from God or either I speak of my own. So hey, if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not sure, he gives you a solution. Yes. Just do it. Yep. Just like Nike. Yes. That's what Nike got from the Bible. <laughs> Just do it. Because in the end, it's about having a cosmic connection. A cosmic connection through supplication, where we, yes, we, we have these amazing prayers, but the job is only finished when we have the actions that correspond to our prayers. Through submission. When we read the Bible and obey the Bible. I want to close out here with a song by John Mayer. And it's entitled Say. And the lyrics say, Take all your wasted honor, every little past frustration. Take all your so-called problems, say what you need to say. Walking like a one-man army, fighting with the shadows in your head. Living at the same old moment, knowing you'd be better off instead. If you only could say what you need to say. Have no fear for giving in. Have no fear for giving over. You'd better know that in the end, it's better to say too much than never to say what you need to say again. Even if your hands are shaking and your faith is broken, even as the eyes are closing, do it with a heart wide open. Say what you need to say. 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 In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, it says, Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Let's go after trusting God and trusting each other. And what we'll do is we will love God and love each other. Let's have a cosmic connection. Amen. Amen.